The name Amalek may not mean anything to you. A-M-A-L-E-K. It's in the early part of the Bible where Esau has a son, I think, Eliphaz, and then Eliphaz has a son named Amalek. And being a descendant of Esau, you know that he represents something very earthy and somewhat primitive. At any rate, we find in Genesis and in Exodus and in Numbers and in First Samuels and in First Chronicles that everybody is fighting Amalek for about 250 years. They kill him, and then the next generation has to kill him all over again. And we finally get the idea that Amalek is not a person. And then when we read about the Amalekites, we realize that they too are not just an ordinary tribe of people, but rather a symbol of all those who follow Amalek. And so finally we have this man Joshua. And he is instructed to go out and slay Amalek. And I'm quite sure that this is not known as the path of initiation to most of the readers of the Bible. And so we are going to see that Joshua is pursuing the path of initiation, which is always pretty much the same. It's the same whether it's done in the 20th century or the 5th century B.C. The inner path, the overcoming of material sense, the slow gradual, gradual elevation of consciousness through the giving up of concepts about a material world, the acceptance of an infinite being, then the identity as the individualization of the infinite being, finally the overcoming and the walls of Jericho fall down. You could make a case for 20 steps, but we'll just follow 12. And you'll see how clearly even the Old Testament is pointing us to walking into what was there called the promised land and what we now know as infinity realized or divine consciousness realized. It says here now that Joshua in defeating Amalek, discomforted Amalek with the edge of his sword. And you may recall that the flaming sword in the Garden of Eden was guarding the tree of life. And that flaming sword is now used by Joshua to discomfort Amalek. And so you have the initiates in a story of using the sword of truth, the sword of spirit, to overcome Amalek, which is here a symbol of material sense. And so what the Bible is telling us is that Joshua knowing himself to be the Spirit of God, knowing the truth of being, was able with this truth to overcome material sense. And it reads to the world that Joshua went forth and slayed Amalek. But there is another parallel to that which is very important. It says here that he used the edge of his sword. And then along comes a man named Jesus and says, I come not to bring peace, but a sword. And so right there we have Joshua, 
and Jesus in a startling parallel. A parallel that deepens in a most amazing way. Joshua means I am God's self. And so you and I, privy to his inner knowledge, knowing that I am God's self, face situations, and that is the edge of the flaming sword with which we overcome material sense. I am God self. I come not to bring peace, not to be comfortable, but to put the sword of truth to all that is unlike my father. And that aligns you with both Joshua and Jesus. We are a different kind of warrior than a physical warrior. Our war is against untruth. Our war is against illusion. Our war is not by the physical sword, but by the inner sword of divine consciousness. But that's exactly what Joshua symbolized. Then we read that Joshua was taken into the tabernacle with Moses. And the Bible says, and he departed not out. Meaning he stayed there. He was taken into the tabernacle, into oneness with his source, with divine consciousness, and he departed not out. One with source. Amazingly, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. And so we have another similarity and we have the second phase of the initiation of Joshua. He is now united with Source. He has entered the tabernacle which he will not depart from. He's going to abide in the consciousness of one infinite self. In John 1.8, Another secret of his initiation is given. This is somewhat amusing because it's something we all do or have been doing for the past 20 or 25 years and before that we never thought of it at all. It never occurred to us. But here it is. This book of the law shall not depart out of the mouth, out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day in and day out that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. Joshua is instructed to get rid of his brain. Don't try to overcome the walls of Jericho with that human brain, Joshua. Meditate, meditate, meditate. When Joel very simply says, you've got to meditate. He's giving you 2,000 years of wisdom that unless you do as Joshua did, as Jesus did, there's no way to accomplish these things that we're talking about. The power of the human will is useless except if you use that will to say, I'm going to meditate. You've got to release that great brain. And Joshua had to, and Jesus had to. And again, the amazing parallel, while Joshua was meditating before he went out to every so-called battle, here's Jesus saying to his disciples, couldn't you watch with me one hour? Here's Jesus saying to his disciples, Take no thought for your life. 
do the lilies take thought? Here's Jesus saying, I do nothing of myself. The Father doeth the works. In other words, meditation is a surrender to infinity. And always we come upon the Master himself without his disciples in deep inner meditation or taking them up to the Mount of Transfiguration or the Mount of Olives, always the inner self ascending first to contact with the infinite before proceeding to teach, before proceeding to follow the ordained inner guidance. And so if we had had this knowledge of the importance of meditation, we'd be in a different world today. We had to wait till somebody came out of India and got on TV and told everybody, this is what you've got to do. And then everybody became interested in transcendental meditation. And then suddenly India was alive with all kinds of seers coming over here. And today, even in our Orthodox churches, there's a condescension to meditate every now and then. Maybe a little room set aside. But meditation is the path of spiritual evolution. We don't have the wisdom. We have to meditate to receive it. We don't have the power. We have to meditate for the comforter to come through and so forth. And this then was the third step in the initiation. The necessity to submit to infinite divine thought and to relinquish individual human thought. To let God run the universe and to become a willing servant unto the inner spirit. In the second chapter of John of, of Joshua, we find a very interesting anecdote or narrative. Joshua sends out a few spies to Jericho. And because they want to spy on the king, they have to find some kind of shelter where they won't be detected. And they are hidden in the house of a harlot. They're very grateful to this woman. And so they promise that if their mission succeeds, they're going to help her family. And later it does succeed, and later they do help her family. And therefore, you find here some interesting initiation for those who are reading it that we are to extend Christ awareness everywhere. The spies or envoys of Joshua are accepting help from the harlot. This is extending the undivided consciousness that there is only one self. Seeing through the appearance to the Christ. And of course it reminds you instantly of Jesus saying to the woman in, adulteress, in adultery, neither do I condemn thee. An amazing parallel. In the fourth step of initiation then, it is your function, after having accepted that material sense is an adversary to be overcome, by living in the knowledge of I am identity, infinite self, spirit, eternal, perfect as my Father, and then dwelling in the knowledge that your flaming sword of truth and spirit is what overcomes material sense, 
and moving on and finally coming to the place where meditation is a normal daily thing, a requirement to enter a higher level of awareness, you then must be faithful to this infinite identity you have accepted even in the face of the harlot or the criminal or the thief or the whatever you bunk into. Usually it's not these broad areas that we are unable to conquer. It's the little ones, the little pesty things, the neighbor who borrowed your two eggs and didn't return them. That we can't do as easily as we can overlook uh, manslaughter or things of that character. It's strange, but we don't recognize that this too is being on guard to step out of infinite oneness. And it's much better, in fact, mandatory, to overcome the sense of resentment or whatever in yourself rather than to step out of your infinite oneness. It's better to suffer the minor aches and pains of this world, but to stay in that oneness, because that's what these are for. They're the challenges. They're all those little spurs along the way that sort of keep you in line. And as you look at them and overcome them and are ready for them and not moved by them, no matter what they are, seeing through the harlot, because the real harlot is the world mind which adulterates the truth. And it may come out in the form of an actual harlot or the form of an actual uh, degraded politician or something of that nature. But you've got to look at all forms of dalliance in this world and see through them as the world mind functioning through an individual who is moving unaware of the self that he is, who has no capacity for, at this moment, attaining the awareness of that self, and it is up to you to do as the two envoys of Joshua did. Later, this entire family turned to the Spirit in deep gratitude for what was done for them by Joshua, in his gratitude for their help. In other words, Joshua and the envoys and the harlot are all in one being, and he is now taking command of more of his being and not letting it be profligate or wasteful as it had been. He is integrating his individuality into one self without opposite. All areas of the personality are being recalled into the one self. And beside not condemning the adulteress, which was a very close parallel, almost an identical one, you find Jesus saying, love thy neighbor as thyself. Now you're going to find that there is a difference between what Joshua does and what Jesus does. Joshua does it in a more direct manner, and then Jesus does it in a higher level. Joshua may save a thousand people walking across the Jordan by putting stones down there. Jesus will just walk across the Jordan by himself. The point is that you may be getting a parallel that this is one soul unfolding as two men at different times. I don't mean just Christ unfolding as Joshua and Jesus because Christ is unfolding as you too and me too and him too and her too. But I mean this is one soul, one unfolding consciousness that we have called both Joshua at one time and Jesus at another. And what they are doing is almost identical except that Jesus does it just at a shade higher level. Well, more than a shade actually. But Jesus puts it all together 
in a more direct fashion that we can understand and identify with. That's the fourth, and I'd like you to see about eight more. We come now to Moses. He's about to die. And the Lord says, Moses, you call Joshua to the tent, to the tabernacle. I want you to appoint him your successor. Now, this is actually part of Joshua's initiation. The chain of command is being clarified. The tree of life is manifesting. There's God, then Moses, then Joshua. And, of course, there's the Christ between Moses and God. And so you're getting the sequence and the impersonalization of it. Joshua simply falls into line. His next assignment is to impersonally serve. This impersonal service with total dedication is part of the spiritual way. We all have to learn to serve the inner spirit in its ordained path, not ours. We really have no lives of our own when we understand the chain of command. That's why Joel used to always stress impersonalizing so much. The minute we put a person in, in these clothes, we start to think a little differently than an impersonal servant of the Spirit. But it is part of the initiation process which leads to eternal life. I think we see a large measure of it in our own group. And there are times when it's quite shocking when you move into certain areas of life where people think just the opposite. It's hard to believe. It's sort of... a a shot across the forehead when you walk out in, in the world and people aren't thinking of you at all. But you are thinking of people and you just can't understand it. But that's part of the transformation in consciousness that has got to take place and only takes place when you start giving out to the world this impersonal dedication. It sows seeds, it comes back and sometimes very quickly. And so Moses now was unable to take his people into the promised land. It's turned over to Joshua. Joshua then represents that activity which is now going to actively lead the total being into awareness of self. And Joshua cannot take the Israelites into the promised land through his power of the sword anymore. He can't do it by force. He has to conquer a different way. He has to conquer by the Spirit. And so it may look like he's going out into battle, but it's going to be not by might or power. It's going to be by impersonal service to an invisible divine intelligence which is lifting the initiate beyond the material sense of life in a way that no human mind can do. Joshua is no longer depending on an outer master named Moses. Do you see that? The mantle has been passed over to him he must now depend on his own inner self totally. So must you. It's just like Jesus leaving the disciples and saying, if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. You must find your place where you are totally self 
sustaining in the spirit in order to enter the promised land of divine consciousness. Jesus also put it this way that the Father worketh and I work hitherto. And so we could say that this impersonal service then is turning yourself over to the Father within. And I know that this is what we're all striving to do with greater skill and greater freedom and greater trust. And I hope by now that you have discovered that it is really more important to fail and to trust the farther within while you're seemingly failing than it is to succeed without having followed the inner instruction of the father success without the father within ordaining the action is going to be a false success failure with the father within ordaining the action is going to be success it cannot fail, in other words. It may appear to you momentarily that you're not getting through. Something isn't happening. You want the guidance. It's not coming. But I say that if you remain in the attitude that without the guidance of the Father, whatever I do is useless anyway, with that knowledge, even as you move your hands, if they are moving in the wrong direction, they will be recalled they will be adjusted. You will find that your devotion to the inner self, to guide itself, to manifest itself, to move you, is the greatest asset you can develop at this stage. Otherwise, there's no substance. There's just a shallow shell of victory. Joshua Moses was saying, find the Father within. I'm going now. It's up to you. And I've got to go because if I don't, you won't find the Father within. It's your job to find that Father. And later Jesus says, the Father within, he doeth the works. One soul unfolding. Yes, it's a great possibility that Joshua reappeared to us as Jesus. In Hebrew, I don't know about the similarity of names, but I know in Greek, Joshua and Jesus are identical. I also know that Joshua is called here the son of, of Nun, and Nun means fish, and the son of fish. And the movement started by Jesus was called the little fishes. There are other similarities. Joshua said to the Hebrews that within three days I'll take you into the promised land. Just as Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up again. The similarities are consistent. We come to a place now where Joshua directs the priests. He wants them to carry the ark across the Jordan. He's leading them into the promised land across the Jordan. There's something about that that's very interesting because crossing the Jordan 
is again an initiate's way of saying leaving the mind and entering the soul realm and so now the initiate in this case Joshua is expanding into his soul powers and so you see the ark and the priests moving across the Jordan this is all his inner consciousness expanding this outward crossing of the Jordan is the inner soul expansion of Joshua telling us that when we have lain down our material sense abided in the quiet to receive of our infinite self from the father within then the powers of the soul issue through to take dominion over the material world to part the waters you see the thread of invisible truth that is being woven by the spirit through this apparently out of visible activity of Joshua it is the inner initiates path to the realization of infinite being without opposite it is now at the point where material law is being demonstrated as not a law at all because the priest can walk through the waters with the ark and soul is revealing the illusion of matter and that is going to be the tottering of the material sense of man each individual then who is abiding at the center of truth in their own being receiving on the mystical tree from the infinite flowing through their Christ awareness into conscious awareness is going through the state that Joshua is therein and in you the priests with their ark move across the Jordan you move silently through the material sense of life and you cross over to the spiritual side this is the path at this point the Jordan was quite important to Jesus too he was baptized in the Jordan and he was also in the waters of the Jordan and here we find another interesting parallel Joshua now enshrines the twelve stones on which the priests walked across the Jordan and so we find that by the use of the twelve stones we are told the nature of his consciousness the nature of the consciousness we must have to walk across the Jordan the Jordan is the mind area today we'd call it the complete conscious and subconscious mind and the twelve stones you use to walk across it are in other words the twelve stones are the method for breaking the world mind in you that mind which every day paints another picture of a, a world which is not our father's kingdom those twelve stones are the sign of infinity only through the knowledge of your infinite self do you have the twelve stones without accepting infinite self one being without opposite no twelve stones because everything must flow from the one creator and without the source nothing and so Joshua is establishing one with source must be maintained at all cost there's no transition for one who is not one with source we rest in conscious awareness of our source as the creator 
and all that the Creator did not create has no existence for us. Because if it did have existence for us, we would have two Creators, and we would not be in conscious union with one Source. Jesus had his twelve stones. He called them disciples. This was his demonstration of infinity. This was the knowledge that I am that self which is the infinite self. And the twelve disciples collectively represent that inner consciousness. You have those twelve disciples. When you are living in the knowledge that I am the infinite self and the Father within is that infinite self expressing and the twelve disciples must issue forth. That's how you cross the Jordan. We've probably covered about six or seven of these similarities and also the initiation steps. Here's a strange one in Joshua 5.2. I lost Joshua. This is uh, probably one of the least understood passages in the Old Testament and probably very seldom discussed. At the time the Lord said unto Joshua, Make thee sharp knives. And circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. And I'm quite sure that the Old Testament had something in mind that has not been suspected by most of the orthodox readers of this Bible. The second circumcision is a very clear initiate command to eliminate all material sense totally this means total surrender to spirit the end of material consciousness in an individual was designated by the second circumcision also if you remember there's a phrase in Paul about circumcising your heart Now this was the eighth or seventh initiation command of total surrender. Jesus did it when he said, made his whip and cleansed the temple. Cleansed the temple so completely from the front to the back that there wasn't anything left except overturned tables and all of the material sense was being eliminated in consciousness in the visible this was the second circumcision visibly and of course no one would connect those two events because only the initiate walking through the inner path is aware of their meaning and now if you've passed this eighth phase if you have circumcised your heart, if you have 
denied the existence of a material world, you have performed the second circumcision. The first was when you accepted that I've got to overcome material sense. The second is when you refuse to accept any reality in matter. And that's about the eighth degree. And that's about where we are probably struggling right now. The capacity to make this clean break from the material sense of life. As we move into the ninth degree, we find a passage which appears many times in the Bible to Moses, to Joshua, to Jesus. But Joshua was told to loose thy shoes, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Loose thy shoes. Now that's taking the material sense of life to the point where you remove all dependence on matter. Loosing the shoes means walk no more in a material world. When Jesus sent out the seventy, he told them to go out without shoes. They were not to walk in a material world, although they seemed to, to the world who saw them. Loose thy shoes. The place where I now stand is his holy ground, meaning it is spirit. What do you need shoes to walk on spirit for? And so, loosing the shoes becomes the symbol of, I walk now in the kingdom of God on earth, in the finished kingdom. Living in the finished kingdom of God now is loosing your shoes. And yesterday, I think, last night, we reached the point where we were talking about living now in heaven. This is where Joshua is in this point, loosing his shoes, just being instructed by the Father within what to do. So you can see clearly that there is a path that has been set by the invisible Christ. It's not a new path, it's just that we're discovering it. And it's the same path for Joshua and Jesus. Joshua is told to take off his shoes. Jesus tells seven who go out to take off their shoes. That means the 70 thoughts within you or the 70 attitudes or the 70 qualities in you, all of your being must go out without shoes. All of your being must be free of material concept. The 69 don't go out without shoes, the 70 do. One doesn't wear them. You don't divide your consciousness between matter and spirit. And in spite of taking off their shoes, it said that they tread on serpents. I'd rather do that with my shoes on. So you know they weren't talking about physical shoes or physical serpents. The serpents were the false thoughts of the world which come as images, forms, things, events. Joshua learned it. Jesus learned it. Both taught it. At different eras and in different ways, but the similarity is more than a coincidence. Now, Joshua captures Jericho. But it's the strangest captivity you ever saw. No airplanes. 
No artillery. They use trumpets, seven trumpets, and a great shout, and the walls fall down. Not by power, not by might, but by the spirit within, all of your illusory world tumbles down. You can see then that the tree of life functions through the Father within you, your acceptance of the totality of it as your being. You become the tree of life. It's you. All that is happening is you. The infinite spirit, the Christ, the Father within, the flow, the comforter, the truth, the spirit, all flowing out of the center of your being and suddenly illusion has no power. Jericho crumbles. It's the city of the senses and the senses are overcome. Not by force, not by armies, but by the seven trumpets, the seven inner steps of truth which you follow finally crumble the wall of illusion. And then you look out at pain, sickness, and death, and you see them for what they are. They were little painted pictures on the wall of illusion. So real to those who have not lived the initiate's path of infinite spirit listening within itself to the Father, following out into the ordained acts, sending out the disciples without shoes, without material sense, even to the last one, making a total circumcision of material sense. And lo and behold, the consciousness strengthened by this, supported by the infinite, just as the sun rays are supported by the sun, undivided from itself, even to the point of not condemning the harlot, seeing only everywhere the perfect invisible self, we have no enemies anymore. And we have no diseases anymore. And we have no disasters anymore because they are not in the new substance of kingdom, the new kingdom of substance which we live in. It's real. It is the only power and it eliminates the shadow of other powers. So this is the initiate path. I've got to read you this one because it's just too, too much. Eight, nine. This is the, I think it's the 11th step. I've been summarizing most of them for you rather than spend all the time reading them because there's something else I want to do. But this one is just too much. And the king of Ai. This, he's captured the king of Ai. Joshua has through this method. And now the king of Ai, he hanged on a tree. It almost takes my breath away when I found that one. Because today, of all days, you know, yesterday would have been even better, but I found it yesterday. <laughs> There's Jesus on a tree doing what Joshua did to that king. And who is that king of Ai? He yanged on a tree. There was no king. He took his personal self by the scuff of the neck and he put it up there on that cross, on that tree, and he said, you are dead forever. 
I am not you. And this was Jesus doing the same, wasn't it? Showing there's no body there to die. And that's what Joshua was doing when he hanged the king of Ai on a tree. You may want to look at that sometime. It's in 829 of Joshua. In other words, in the 11th stage there, mortality is no more. Jesus demonstrated the end of mortality. The non-reality of mortality is more accurate. And if we can begin accepting the non-reality of mortality and hang that king of Ai on a tree, that personal ego, that personal self, that personal sense of here I am and I'm going to get my share, you know. That's overcoming the false sense of self and the false life of that sense of self and putting yourself right where you belong in infinity, in the invisible kingdom of heaven here now. Joshua now is almost a total initiate. Whatever the last step is, we'll see. Well, the last step is to explain how he did it. And that's the phrase, sun, moon, stand thou still. Sun, stand thou still. Moon, stand thou still. He has combined his soul and his spirit. His soul and his spirit are now one. He has undergone the mystical marriage. And that's the summation of Joshua's inner journey. The inner spirit and the soul are now fused. He has now come into the full stature of Christhood, the full stature of the true man. You man has become God-man, and he still walks the earth. Even though he has crucified his personal self, he still walks the earth. Now this was a forerunner of the Christ Jesus, wasn't it? And then, I don't know how this happened, but it happened. And I've got to share it with you. I've looked it up in a lot of Bibles. But in only one does it do this, and it happens to be the one I have here. In Acts 7.44. I think I put that place here before. Acts 7.44. This is incredible. Our fathers had a tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen. Now this is at the time of Moses, which also our father that came after brought in with Jesus, and they really mean Joshua. This is talking about the time of Joshua, and they say Jesus. Is it a slip of the tongue, or are they trying to tell us something? Now, if you take that passage, Acts 7.45, go to any Bible, it says Joshua. It says it. Now, the parallel between Jesus and Joshua then may be an accurate one to the point that Jesus is the reincarnation of Joshua. And from that, much can develop in your consciousness if you dwell upon it. I think the evidence to me is very convincing. Acts 7.45, by a slip of the tongue, says Jesus, where... Joshua is intended, and every other Bible says Joshua. It's as if Jesus were living at the time when Joshua was, and Spirit somehow wanted us to know this, perhaps, that there was a continuity 
of one soul unfolding as both appearances. Okay. That, to me, would take days and days of meditating on to get the full significance or even a, a fraction of it. Now, initiation is not just in the New Testament. As you can see, it's in the Old Testament. And we've got to go now to something that we're all very familiar with, and yet we have not known of it as initiation. What I'm trying to do is to assure you that you are here on earth to pursue this path of initiation, which has been laid out invisibly for everyone in the world to be exposed to it, to accept it, and finally to have accepted it so completely that when they learn the truth of it, they can't turn around and say, I don't accept it. Just as the book of Revelation, as you know, is being rejected in many orthodox quarters. Well, it, it's, it's not practical. It's not down to earth. It's just another apocalypse. We have so many of those. It shouldn't even be in the Bible. That sort of thing. Well, you can't say that about the 23rd Psalm. You take that out of the Bible and you might as well start just picking pages out at random. Throw them away. You can't take it out any more than you could take the life of Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to see that the 12 initiation steps are in the 23rd Psalm, and that's what it's all about. That's all it's about. We call it the 23rd Psalm. That's not its real name. This is really the song of the sacrificial lamb. The sacrificial lamb is the one who has accepted that he must sacrifice his human selfhood to live in his divine self. And that's the inner secret of the 23rd Psalm. We usually take it up with the thought, well, it's very comforting, and I can read it and just feel good. But it's not to be very comforting, it's to be a sword. It's to open you to the powers of your own soul. And each word, each verse, or each combination of verses, is another initiate step, just like Joshua is. And just like the life of Jesus is. The moment you say, the Lord is my shepherd, you're saying, there has to be a sheep somewhere. And that must be me. And there has to be a very young sheep. And that makes you the young sheep who is learning to walk in the path of invisible righteousness. The moment you have said, the Lord is my shepherd, you're saying, I accept the infinity of God as the only without opposite. I have no other shepherd. I follow infinite spirit alone. That's step number one in the initiation process outlined in the 23rd Psalm. Now, 